Welcome you all to this course on electron diffraction and imaging. In the last two classes, we have discussed uh, uh, phase contrast microscopy or high resolution transmission electron microscopy or you can call it as atomic resolution microscopy. Uh, let us uh, before we proceed further, let us have a recap of what we have covered in the last two classes. Okay. In the first class what we considered was an ideal microscope where all lens aberrations are assumed to be 0 and we assumed that uh, essentially coherent elastic scattering of the incident plane wave is taking place within that sample okay. and the wavelength of the radiation is uh, much uh, smaller than that of the atomic spacing in the sample. Then what we did essentially was that we tried to find out at any point on that image okay, what is going to be the contribution from the various beams that is the beams which have scattered that is from the sample as the beam enters into the sample it is getting this is transmitted beam and the beams which are diffracted in different directions d1, d2 we can write it all these beams okay, they come together and form an image. So, what we try to do is essentially is th this term tells what is going to be the amplitude of the transmitted wave and what is that as it travels some distance and reaches here at this point, at that point what is the phase which it is going to generate. So, all these waves are allowed to again join together, interfere. Okay. This interference pattern is what is giving rise to diffraction. Then we considered the case where it is essentially a two beam condition where only the transmitted beam and only one of the diffracted beam is there. In this case what happens is that intensity if we consider is essentially fluctuating with respect to G where G is the reciprocal lattice spacing. But what is essentially important is that this is the amplitude of the wave and the intensity is nothing but I equals psi psi star. So, this term itself is a complex term. Okay. The phase factor which is there in this term, okay, they cancel each other. So, in the intensity, the phase information about that sample is lost. Though we get some uh, uh, intensity fluctuations that can give uh, information about the, peri the periodicity okay, or the lattice spacing in some directions, but how atoms are arranged in that plane that information is totally lost. Okay. This is, but even then this, this is one an ideal high resolution electron microscopy condition which we have. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, if lambda is assumed to be uh, smaller than the interparticle spacing, then the point to point resolution is decided by the Rayleigh's criterion. If all the lens aberrations are not there, then wavelength of the radiation decides the resolution then we should be able to resolve the atoms in an ideal condition. But what is the reality? Before we go into that, we will just uh, we consider that case where in a two beam condition when two spots are considered this gives rise to a fringe contrast. Okay. This is typically what we obtain, uh, we have obtained in a zirconium on niobium using two beam condition. Okay. If we use multiple beams then fringes due to each of the beams we will be getting it. Actually this uh, fringe space uh, if we look at it the spacing that is that uh, uh, planes on which the maximum or minimum intensity occurs they are perpendicular to the diffraction vector. Okay. Uh, if many spots if we use to create uh, lattice fringes then this uh, intersecting fringes will give rise to a dot contrast and this dot contrast will uh, appear like an atomic uh, resolution, but though this does not truly represent atomic resolution which we have discussed in detail in the previous classes. Okay. But what is the reality in a microscope? The lenses have uh, uh, aberrations associated with it. In an ideal lens, we should have uh, uh, no aberration and in such a case for a point object, we should get a point image. What does the spherical aberration do for an point object? We do not get a point image, we get a spread in the intensity. 
Okay. That means that uh, there is a variation in the uh, intensity from the center to the optic axis to the, the directions. Okay. Th this is due to spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, astigmatism, all of them give rise to this sort of uh, uh, spread. Okay. So, the point to point get resolution get degraded considerably, this is one of the things. So, these are all the aberrations all these things which we considered. Okay. Yeah. We will come to it a little bit later, but what is essentially going to happen is that when this sort of a situation arises, okay, uh, if you have two points objects from which the rays are coming, they will be uh, since there is a spread in the uh, beam in the image plane, okay, there will be unnecessarily uh, interference of these beams giving rise to artifacts will be there. So, that also adds to complexity in the analysis. So, in a normal microscope with lens aberration, okay, in the last class how we considered is essentially that incident wave, we considered it as a spherical wave. Okay. This is because whenever we talk of a wave phenomena and diffraction which is occurring, the hygiene's principle has to be used. The hygiene's principle as it says that the even if it is a plane wave which is going to be there, from every point on the wave you have a spherical wavelet which is getting emanating from these points. Okay. From each of these points the spherical wavelets if we consider at any particular point P here, okay, there is going to be a contribution from the various regions of this point okay, from the spherical surface okay, and that is how we can find out what is going to be the amplitude at this particular point when the wave propagates. Okay. So, this essentially gives that as the spherical wave propagates at any particular point okay, what is going to be the amplitude that is given by the incident wave amplitude into e to the power of i k r by r. Okay. What is a wave propagator? The wave propagator is the one which tells that from here to here from all these points okay, there is a contribution going to come to this uh, wave here, but each of these rays from here to here or from here to here they travel a different uh, distance. So, the path length is different, so they introduce a phase. So, this gives rise to modifies okay, the uh, amplitude of the wave which reaches each point okay, and this is called as the wave propagator. Okay. This is one term which will be coming into the picture. Another what happens is that the lens itself when we consider it, okay, we know that uh, we draw the lens like this, it is a spherical lens. Okay. The lens itself, what is the action of the lens for a point object? Okay it forms a point image. That means that essentially if you consider the spherical wavelets which are coming like this, this spherical wavelets has to change the direction and then it will be brought back to a focus at this point. That means that the waves which are traveling in this direction, there is a phase shift which has to be that lens what it does is a differential phase shift which introduces to the beam which is coming there. So, that it will be. Okay. That is what this phase shift is given by this term. Okay. In addition to it, the rays which travel along the optic axis and the wave which travel like this and when they reach there, okay, the spherical aberration is going to focus this ray to a particular point, the ray which comes here it is focused to an another point. Okay. That also introduces an additional phase shift and that is given by uh, this term. This term essentially is given in a reciprocal space this W delta k this is called as a delocalization term. Okay. And uh, since it is in reciprocal space we have to take a Fourier transform map to get it in real space. So, that is how we get that lens this is the total lens distortion. So, so far what you have considered is the incident wave okay, which is coming okay, and is propagating okay, and uh, uh, it is uh, hitting that sample. So, how do we define that sample? Okay. For high resolution microscopy, the way we define that sample 
as that the sample acts as a one which changes the phase of the incident wave as it passes through okay there is no other change which uh, takes place and the phase change which it introduces depends upon what is the sort of potential it sees it as it passes through the sample that is if this is the thickness of that sample as the beam enters we have atoms which are sitting at different points on the sample surface there is uh, potential which is associated with this uh, point so it has to pass through this potential what it is going to do is change introduce a phase shift okay that phase shift is because the electron energy has an energy if you assume that E0 as it enters some potential which it sees V. So, it is going to bring about a small change in that in the kinetic energy of the electron okay, or the K of that electron. Okay. This as it passes through different thicknesses we can integrate uh, the total phase shift which it comes and that is what essentially this gives and this term is essentially an absorption when it comes. So, this is the term which gives what is going to be the absorption this is the phase shift and this is the absorption term this is how we describe a sample ok. This is called as the sample is called as a phase object this is what we consider. Then what we did was that ok we made an another approximation that the thickness of the sample is small ok mu is also small absorption and this potential phi ok or the uh, uh, phase shift phi is uh, small so that uh, we can uh, expand e to the power of uh, this one in terms of a series expansion. Then finally that f of x y will turn out to be what essentially means that this term says is that essentially as the beam passes through that sample if it is passing on a position where an atom is there or if it passes in between the potential which it sees is going to different. So, as a function of uh, x and y on that sample surface like if you look at it this is how the atoms are seen ok and the beam direction in this case will be perpendicular to it if that electron beam is falling here or falling here that is going to be a variation in the phase shift which is going to be introduced from point to point as the beam comes out on the other side ok. So, both in absorption as well as the phase shift ok and generally uh, it is easier to work in a uh, reciprocal space. So, if we do that we can take a Fourier transform of this and this is what essentially the Fourier transform uh, gives it ok. Before we uh, so this is how that sample is described both in uh, uh, real space as well as in the Fourier space how it will be. Are described here instead of 1 it becomes delta function ok. Let us uh, then we looked at what is the combined effect of spherical aberration and defocus ok. As I mentioned earlier what does the spherical aberration do as uh, the beam which is closer to the uh, optic axis that is focused at a point the ray which is uh, traveling for example in the case of a microscope the diffracted rays will be uh, away from the making an angle with respect to a optic axis assume that they come like this and this is the end of that uh, uh, lens that is the uh, outermost radius of the lens from which it is uh, uh, scattered uh, 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 refracted. Then this comes to a, a focus at this particular point ok. That means that the ray should in principle as for the geometrical optics all the rays ok uh, is focused to a particular point in the image, but that does not occur some rays are brought to a focus earlier because of this there is a spread which is going to come ok. What is going to be the case when we consider uh, a small defocus if we introduce the effect of the defocus is essentially going to be that the ray instead of being brought close to the optic axis ok it is deviated away from the optic axis. But the dependency here it is going to be epsilon is to theta up to a power of 3 here it is going to be theta ok. So, the net displacement or the net uh, size of the object for a point object in the Gaussian plane will be given by this uh, particular formula which depends upon uh, 
delta k, delta k is nothing but uh, g the diffraction vector okay and then c is okay the spherical aberration coefficient of the lens and uh, uh, delta f is the defocus these are all the options. for some particular value of uh, defocus okay for a specific value of theta this term can turn out to be 0. But uh, we know that uh, when a diffraction takes place when we orient it for a, a, a perfect uh, uh, zone axis condition okay we get a lot of uh, diffraction spots all diffraction spots are uh, going to come okay and all having an uh, equal intensity and each may be at different distances from the center. So, when they pass through that lens this delta k is also going to be different because of which this w will be changing with respect to the g vector okay. So, as I mentioned now the intensity of the uh, uh, spot if we have to consider it uh, the object function which we have described that has to be that will be modified by this uh, factor that w to the power of phi uh, uh, w into delta k x minus delta k by this term. So, this if we with what essentially is going to happen is that this first term corresponds to a direct beam, the second term essentially corresponds to amplitude contrast and absorption and the third term which is the phase contrast term okay. Now, if we look at it when we use many beams to get a fringe contrast okay the w is going to change, but what is essentially important is that okay uh, the value of w can go from positive to negative depending upon what is the value of g which we choose it okay. If the value is between 0 and minus 1 okay all the beams will essentially with respect to this it is going to give rise to a uh, subtraction of this one that means that they are going to add and then uh, in constructive interference will take place. That essentially means that we are going to get a contrast enhancement okay. Suppose the different beams introduce different values for this one plus and minus then these terms can cancel each other and finally no contrast may be seen. So, to get the best contrast in a high resolution microscopy okay the for all the values of g which we use to interfere okay they should add uh, uh, enhance the contrast okay. This how we can decide is using this term the w we have derived and we have shown that expression and this expression itself if you try to plot it as a function of uh, uh, delta k okay or the g for various C s and D focus value of the lens okay. Then this is the sort of a uh, term this is for a specific uh, uh, D focus value which correspond to what is called as the Scherzer D focus which has been defined earlier okay uh, in the last class okay. Now we can see that for most of the values from here to here essentially the uh, sin W k value turns out to be nearly that same okay and it is all negative that means that this will add to enhancement of the contrast okay. This is for a uh, lens with an aberration only a spherical aberration and defocus which we consider. But there are many causes of aberration like that aperture can uh, uh, give rise to a phase shift okay. Then uh, sample drift, drift in that image that can also add to it. Then chromatic most important part of is that chromatic aberration can also give rise to a defocus. So, the effect of all these envelope functions is that uh, in this particular case if we consider it this is going to fluctuate between some values, but what is essentially going to happen is that that fluctuation essentially stops and comes to a 0 okay. This is called as the information limit. So, beyond this particular one higher values of uh, in a G does not contribute to the uh, contrast in the high resolution image okay that is what essentially it is being uh, given mentioned okay. This I showed some pictures to tell that how with the different defocus values for a microscope with a CS value how the image contrast is changing we can see between this and this 
you can see that there is a change in contrast here again there is a change in contrast okay. okay. Uh, finally, how does this contrast change come? It is because if we have a point object as I had mentioned earlier what the optical system does it is there is a spread in the uh, image which is going to take place. But if you have two points are there very close to each other which are, which are resolved by the beam but uh, in the image space we find that there is going to be a uh, interference that is overlap of this disc. When this disc overlap this gives rise to some contrast variations okay. So, the actual contrast variation is not corresponding to each of these points it is uh, some sort of an artifacts which can come because of for all these effects okay. Interpreting the high resolution images in a qualitative way just looking at the image is going to be very difficult. So, we have to do some uh, quanti uh, to get uh, quantitative information okay. Uh, image simulation has to be carried out to interpret the results okay. So, that is what essentially it says that uh, unnecessarily contrast comes interpretation becomes difficult phase contrast image is not always a projection uh, of direct projection of atomic structure okay. And another is that HRTM images depends upon several adjustable this spread depends upon several adjustable parameters lens aberrations sample thickness all and uh, then convergence of the beam there are so many factors it depends on okay. So, the image simulation is a must the first image simulation model was developed by Cowley and Moody and they published it in 1957 itself okay. Now, several commercial software packages are available to do this simulation okay, but these are all like black boxes. So, when you are using it any of these packages if you have more than one package it is better to check whether the data which is information which is given by one package okay has some consistency if you try to do with other packages each works on a different principle and different way in which these packages are operating okay. As I mentioned that uh, the major problem in getting from this high resolution dotty contrast which we get it uh, the uh, position of atoms in the unit cell is because the phase information has been lost when the intensity mapping is uh, taking place. So, that means that from the intensity we cannot go back from image to the structure. So, to get some information about it what we have to do is that we have to assume some model of the structure if you have some prior idea and then do some what is called as a technique which is called the multi slice method to find out what is going to be the phase amplitude okay. So, in this particular slide which is taken from uh, Thomas Lagrange's uh, presentation okay. essentially this is the source and all these cases the source has to be a Fiji. So, if we take a field emission gun source what we can do it is that the beam spread could be reduced considerably that means that the chromatic abrasion could from the source could be reduced okay. If the objective lens currents are uh, uh, stabilized uh, okay all the fluctuations are reduced then the contribution to uh, defocus from that could be reduced considerably okay to a chromatic aberration and uh, then whatever if the sample is taken as very thin specimen then also the contribution to uh, spheric uh, chromatic aberration from the uh, beam as it passes through the sample that could also be reduced because of inelastic scattering okay. Here what is being shown is that uniform illumination which is coherent and which is falling onto the specimen and as it comes out and this electron source even though the electrons which are coming we consider as a wave it is a plane wave and we see that as if the wave is getting distorted okay. The objective lens because of spherical aberration it adds to it a distortion and finally in the image when this uh, amplitude psi psi star we take that image intensity there are some fluctuations that is what essentially given how mathematically each of these uh, operations uh, results in the change in intensity okay. What is done in uh, multi slice uh, calculation? Let us just go in little bit detail okay. First we assume that sample to be essentially a weak phase object approximation that is what essentially is being done. 
that means that the, the sample can be considered like a uh, at, uh, these are all the positions of atoms or you can consider or position or some potential variation can as the plane wave comes and enters okay as it comes out of the sample surface we can see that uh, the wave fronts have changed because uh, as the beam passes through that sample okay uh, there is variation in the phase shifts are being introduced okay. This calculation how exactly it is done is that you assume that the plane wave is coming and corresponding to this there is a potential which is there going to fluctuate as a function of position okay and as it interacts with this and it is going to modify the wave as it comes out of this thin small thickness of that sample okay. Then this has to be propagated from here to here and which propagates it reaches here with some wave function psi dash. Again the potential operates on it okay it modifies this. Uh, that side to again a propagation factor as I mentioned earlier has to take and this whole. So, this way we have to take it for the various thicknesses and finally, we get what is going to be the uh, exit wave this is called as that exit wave function that is at the back of that sample how uh, as a function of x and y the wave uh, the wave function is changing ok. In the HRTM this one so, this is the multi slice calculation which we have to do and for that we beam approximation. Then now once this has been done we have to take the transfer function and the contrast function of that sample also has to be added on to it ok. But this entire for, uh, perfect way of doing it is taking a block wave approach ok. I will just mention uh, briefly about real space formalism but uh, others you can see in the text. So, as I mentioned earlier that incident beam as it contacts it passes through the sample there are many diffracted beams this propagates and uh, as it reaches here we get uh, the new uh, the wave function is going to be different again it propagates this is what we have calc done earlier. So, essentially what happens is that in this case that psi describes the electron wave p represents the propagation of the electron wave in free space that is in the microscope or in the sample also from each layer or some particular thickness d z of that sample, sample is taken into a small slice ok. And then from each of this slice delta z if it corresponds to a unit cell we can represent an atom one layer and then we calculate what is going to be the uh, exit wave at the back of this and then propagate it from here to here to reach the front of it that is how these calculations are done ok and q is the specimen itself is in this case is considered something like a phase greeting ok that is the q represents the phase greeting. So, every layer when we have to calculate this is essentially a convolution of the various terms which we are uh, taking it and here it is essentially in a reciprocal space we are doing it, but the same function in a real space approach also we can do it ok both methods are possible. In this particular one ok what is being for a quasi crystal various uh, positions of atoms on various planes is being shown three planes which are shown ok. And the calculations are done to find out how at the end of each one of them the four simulated images for these models are being shown. We can make out that this shows the five fold uh, symmetry ok. So, in short if you summarize ok what do we do in image simulation? The first thing which you have to find out is that exit wave function at the back of that sample because the beam is a perfect plane wave which is coming into this one ok. And the plane wave passes through that sample ok and then what is going to be the wave function at that exit one. At the back focal plane of the objective lens at the diffraction pattern we have to consider and at that image plane this exit wave how it is going to be modified that is because of the uh, distortion and the diffraction both of them will give rise to ok. <coughs> so, what are the various steps which are uh, required one is evaluating the scattering from a single slice ok in the multi slice uh, uh, calculation and each slice ok after that uh, exit wave has been calculated allow it to propagate and reach the next slice ok and then uh, find out what is going to be the exit view at the back of it and then allow it to propagate and calculate till we reach the 
uh, back of that sample okay. Then the uh, this process modifies both the phase and the amplitude at the exit wave function okay. Then this iteration how we go about it okay. This will give rise to some image okay and it is a simulated image which we can compare with the experimental observation because here when we take that all the various factors which we are taking as the envelope functions those functions should correspond to the microscope parameters okay. If the matching is not perfect maybe in the model of the atom which we have chosen some modification some changes in the atomic structure of the sample has to be uh, incorporated okay. By doing that and again repeating this uh, process okay we do till we get a perfect uh, matching of that image and then we say that this is what is the uh, structure of the sample for this particular uh, set of uh, particular conditions under which the image has been taken okay. This is exactly what is being uh, uh, shown for a microscope in this schematic flow chart of that simulation which is normally used okay. This is the model structure which we use it. This is a projected potential for that model structure okay. Then the object transmission function and the diffraction we get it. Then we put the transfer function of the lens objective aperture function and all these things when we do this is what that image which we get it okay. In this way of image simulation the way we went about is we assuming a model structure and then incorporate all the aberrations and try to get a matching of the simulated image with the actual image which we have observed and then to try to find out which is the structure which gives the best matching and we say that this is what the structure of the specimen should be for this image okay. okay. Uh, there are some limitations associated with it the true lattice image you obtain only at uh, Scherzer defocus okay. For other conditions uh, uh, also closer to it there are some images which we get it okay. If we wanted to do a good uh, to find out the structure correctly okay taking this uh, the effect of the microscope we know and how it is going to affect the image far away from the defocus for all those conditions we do an image matching and so that the model structure which we develop okay is able to explain the intensity contrast which we obtain for different defocus values okay. Then about delocalization of atom positions all these aspects which I had mentioned already. But what essentially one should understand is that just the picture if you look at it it is not an atomic resolution picture. So we have to that uh, image simulation is a must to get the correct information okay. There is an another uh, thing which is also being done which is we, we call it as an image processing. Image processing what is being done is that we do not record that uh, uh, high resolution images okay. Instead what we do is collect the data okay. Now uh, either using a CCD okay then the data can be quantified and that too you know that the range is very dynamic in CCD okay very large dynamic range is there. So a linear uh, quantification uh, is possible linear data collection okay. Then what we can do it is that uh, uh, using many other uh, image processing softwares we can remove the effects of various aspects of it okay like if the noise is there okay we can uh, remove how if you remove the noise how it is going to take place okay. Suppose a drift is there we know this is the drift. So if you do a correction for the drift how the image will appear that way also we can try to do eliminate the various effects and try to find out how the image will appear in the absence of all of this and then do a comparison with that image simulated okay. That is what essentially this has some advantage also like for example this is a what happens this is an image which has been collected okay for a small region we can choose and do an FFT. So this gives rise to a pattern which is like a diffraction pattern. Here if you look at it this streaking essentially is due to the uh, artifact of this uh, FFT okay. We can choose and uh, remove many of these artifacts and then try to join all from this particular region we can choose that spot 
and then try to reconstruct back that image and try to compare how it uh, uh, looks like yeah, that is a processed image ok. In this uh, uh, process we can uh, get information about what is astigmatism, defocus, CES all these effects also uh, what is that effect on that uh, actual image which we obtain we can get that information and that can also be eliminated from the image which you have obtained. There is an another uh, fact which happens that suppose we take uh, just grab one image ok that is uh, then this is how it looks like ok. If we use a video camera we can grab that image many times from that same area and we can do a frame averaging. Now you can see that this has led to an enhancement in the uh, 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 contrast of that image. So, these are all the various things which are possible using uh, uh, image processing ok. okay. Having talked about all this uh, the other aspects of it which we thought that uh, uh, we mentioned that the CS is one that spherical aberration of a lens which cannot be uh, correct because we have to live with it because all the lenses which we use in an electron microscope are convex lenses. So, for a spherical convex lenses the spherical aberration is already limited if you have to reduce the spherical aberration you have to reduce the po pole piece, uh, gap between the pole piece that means that reducing the gap between the pole piece means that the tilt everything we have to compromise on that ok. What is the other way in convenience? So, since the development of the microscope people have been trying to look at it how can we correct for the uh, CES. We know that in optical uh, lens system ok using a combination of convex and convex lenses ok we can correct for uh, spherical aberration ok that is uh, using lenses with different uh, refractive indexes or convex and combination of convex or plano convex, plano convex, uh, concave all these lenses could be joined together to get uh, lenses where all aberrations have been corrected ok. And can this be done in a microscope? Since uh, beginning of uh, this century ok such systems have been developed ok with which now the resolution of the order of uh, 0 0.0 here it is written 8 nanometer up to 5 nanometer is in principle as possible and has been achieved in that microscope. Like energy filtered microscope this I had already talked about earlier ok. So, what is the advantage of CS correction that is CS essentially is uh, spherical aberration is uh, corrected. Not only the spherical aberration can be corrected now the spherical aberration can be made negative also that has also got some advantages ok. What is the advantage of doing this sort of uh, correction ok. Since it is done external to the lens that is we have a if this is a lens system there is an another series of lens systems which are being put which do all these corrections ok computer control system. That means that as far as the original lens is concerned the pole piece gap is quite high so that we can have a tamp sample and we tilt it ok. And uh, then with uh, high uh, that when CS is corrected we know that the factor W delta k which we wrote it this is the delocalization factor. If uh, CS becomes small ok this depends upon the two terms CS and delta f ok. If CS becomes small ok or we make it 0 ok then this delocalization could be reduced to also to made 0. Similarly, as CS is being made small the delta f also defocusing is also necessary not necessary because the defocusing is uh, the one which we use it to compensate. Uh, for the spherical aberration so that some range of uh, delta k values ok we have uh, for this sin omega ok uh, for the various uh, g vectors ok they always uh, constructively interfere to give rise to enhancement in contrast in the image ok. A schematic diagram which I am showing it here is using a convex lens ok which has a spherical aberration some value. 
So, because of this at the Gaussian plane we get some uh, image okay. and then there is a risk of least confusion whether the size of the image reduces. Okay. How to reduce the effect of uh, this spherical aberration? We put an aperture so that the half axis beam is reduced then the spherical aberration could be reduced considerably. The other way we can do it is that we can include a convex lens okay, which essentially what it does it is a depending upon the lens choosing a lens of a particular value okay, particular size and focal length. Okay. We can make uh, these beams which are far away from it also bend a little away from it so that all are focused so that for a point object we get a point image or this value can be that such that the spheric aberration becomes it is more like a, a concave lens it behaves. So, that way also we can reduce the, we can make the spherical aberration negative. Okay. So, this what we can see here is that essentially the rays which are coming far away from the optic X only they have to be bent a little bit. Okay. How can this be achieved in a microscope? This we have discussed earlier when we talked about lens aberration that if we use a, a stigmator, okay, stigmator is nothing but uh, uh, either a quadruple uh, okay, lens system which is being used. Then what it happens is that the field will be from here to here, from here to here, here to here like this that field is going to vary. The effect of this field is going to be only the rays which are away from the optic axis they are going to be uh, deflected, but whereas the rays which are going to be uh, on that optic axis okay, they are not getting affected. That means that by controlling the voltages which are being applied to these various ones okay, the effect of uh, we can introduce different amount of deflection to different beams which are off that axis. Okay. This same stigmator is used to correct for astigmatism in the microscope. Now, that same type of stigmator which are used this could be either quadrupole uh, lenses or this could be a hexapole. Okay. There are two types of lens system which has been made. Okay. For neon company what they have made it is essentially using some uh, uh, normal uh, lenses and uh, quadruple uh, lenses okay they could make the spherical aberration okay almost zero okay that same thing which could be done this was that C was in Germany this was uh, developed okay here also what they have it is uh, some three hexapole uh, two hexapole lenses and some where they call it as a transfer lens which is being used with this what is essentially is being done is that the spherical aberration is corrected Okay. Also that uh, in addition to spherical aberration half axis ray they give rise to uh, the what is that aberration which is called as the comma. Okay. Both comma and the spherical aberration which is being corrected. This correction is uh, as we said why this spherical aberration itself comes because in the formula for the refractive index we use that sin that is refractive index mu equals sin theta by sin phi if we take it these values for paraxial rays where we assume that the theta is so, and phi are so small that this can be written as theta by phi. But actually sin theta is written as theta minus theta cube by 3 factorial plus theta to the power of phi by phi factorial this is how the series expansion will go. So, when we correct for the spherical aberration essentially this the third order correction is corrected very easily with these lenses. Okay. But this lens system itself will introduce some corrections all these things are uh, corrected and finally we get one with very small spherical aberration values. Okay. Here what is being shown is the transfer function for a microscope which is an uncorrected one and that is where the spherical aberration coefficient C s is 1.23 mm. And this solid line correspond to one for which the spherical aberration has been uh, 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 corrected that is a corrected lens and for which the C s turns out to be 0 0.05 mm. You can make out that how drastically it has changed 
then the Scherzer d focus also changes ok that C C value essentially remaining the same and the energy of the radiation which is used. So, one, this is one of the first microscope which the earlier microscope which they had constructed with which for the uh, gallium arsenide structure along uh, 110 planes the separation between them they could uh, see it ok. This separation is essentially 0.14 nanometer. Now, the present day microscopes which have come with which the separations of the order of 0 0.05 nanometer between these dumbbells could be seen and this was done in a microscope FEA microscope which has a plus minus 40 degree uh, tilt uh, sample holder ok. What is the effect of making the de uh, delocalization because at the edge of it the frontal fringes appear the effect of these frontal fringes essentially going to be that blurring of the image which takes place here ok. When CS is corrected right up to the end this is for a goal you can see that the atom positions could be seen very clearly ok. And uh, another is uh, in many of these images ok uh, as I mentioned earlier this is one way in which uh, high resolution could be obtained. The other mode in which we can do it is uh, in a scanning transmission mode ok. In a scanning transmission mode what we do is that we make the beam scan on the surface of the sample. If we can make the size of the beam as small as possible ok, but to make the size of the beam as small as possible all the aberrations of the condenser lenses have to be corrected ok. Using this sort of correctors we can make the beam size as small as now about 0 0.1 nanometer one. Then if the sample is sufficiently thin ok beam of 1 nanometer size if it falls onto it if the sample is a very thin sample if we use it the spread is going to be very small. So, essentially as the beam passes through the sample at various points we will be able to find out depending upon whether it fall on, falls on that uh, column of atoms or whether it is in between the intensity of the electrons which come out will be different. So, it gives a uh, true uh, 2D projection of the uh, column structures ok. Here what is it being done is that uh, this is for a strontium titanate ok. Uh, this sort of uh, structures the intensity has been calculated. Suppose what it happens is that along some of these columns one of these columns some atom positions atoms are missing. So, if atoms are missing then the it uh, the contribution to scattering from those regions could be different ok. Because of that we find that some region you see that there is uh, almost 0 this shows that there are some atoms are missing on this column. This sort of information also we can obtain not only that suppose an atom is displaced from a particular lattice site what is the displacement this sort of displacement also could be measured this is because the resolution with which the spatial resolution with which we can measure is of the order of a few uh, uh, picometers 10 picometer as less that is what essentially it is because of this in a strontium uh, titanate we know that uh, because of a slight shift a tetragonal distortion comes titanium atom and that is what it gives rise to the piezoelectricity ok. These are some few examples which we have ok and uh, not only that we can find out also that how it is going to be the quantify what is going to be the uh, intensity along each of these columns all this information which we can and get it ok. This is an another classic example in which the gated oxide uh, image of MOSFET ok. This is with an uncorrected microscope here we can see that one side is an amorphous this side is a uh, uh, silicon that is a, a crystalline one. If we see here we, we are not able to see the sharp image of this dumbbell ok. When we use a corrected microscope with a CS which is uh, you see that minus 3 micrometer then we can see the atomic resolution right up to the end of that amorphous region even in the amorphous region you can see that there is a clarity ok. This is an another example 
in which the effect of delocalization, how the delocalization uh, disturbs that uh, atomic resolution contrast or the lattice resolution contrast. This is one where the image is taken as a Gaussian plane on an uncorrected one. This is on a uh, uh, multi layer sample or that silicon with COSI2 interface. Okay. Here at the using the disk of least confusion if we try to find out okay, sorry, then you see that that image cannot be seen very clearly in this region. When we use a CS corrected microscope it becomes very clear that we can see all the atom positions okay, can be seen very clearly. This is a real advantage of a high resolution microscopy or CS corrected microscopy can do. Okay. So, what are the advantages? Occupancy along the column can be determined suppose depending upon how much of atoms are going to be along each of the column that information can be determined. And if atoms are shifted from their normal position what is the shift? That of the order of less than 10 uh, uh, picometer that could be measured. Then using negative spherical aberration coefficient the transfer function for the different uh, 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 atomic numbers okay, they change because normally what happens is that when we take a, a microscope in a conventional microscope a high resolution image. Okay, the contribution to scattering comes mostly from the high Z elements. Okay, the low Z element effect is not seen that clearly. Okay. What essentially happens is that if you use a negative spherical aberration okay, uh, then we can modify that uh, contrast so that corresponding to all the elements because this Tronchian titanate is an example where you can see that the contribution from uh, strontium, okay, the contribution from titanium, contribution from oxygen all of them could be seen very clearly in these images. Okay. And another is uh, when we are able to uh, find out the atom positions very precisely then the lattice parameter could also be determined very accurately. Okay. But for getting all this information image simulation is a must because even under this but for doing this sort of a work what we do require essentially is a field emission gun. A microscope uh, which is fitted with a field emission gun is required because uh, that gives a source with a very high spatial coherence. Okay. And even if uh, there is a, the beam is not perfectly parallel, okay, still we get a highly coherent beam. Okay. And another one is that uh, the spread of the energy spread of the beam is very small in the case of a, a, a field emission gun compared to thermionic or uh, uh, LAB6 filament. Okay. In such cases, uh, especially the if we want, because if we can reduce the energy spread still further in an FEG, the advantage will be that the uh, chromatic aberration could be reduced. That is, even if we correct all the spherical aberration and make it zero, okay. Now the uh, whatever is the spread or delocalization which is occurring in the image is coming due to chromatic aberration. So, if you have to make it small okay, we have to use some filters. Okay. When such filters have been added okay, the spread in energy can be brought down to delta E to about something like uh, 0 0.2 electron volt. Okay. So, finally, what I would like to say that with the corrected microscopes we get truly atomic uh, resolution. Okay. But to do all these calculations okay, we have to assume some model of a sample for an ideal condition it is a perfect crystal 
or if some defects are present, when the defects are there, how the defects are going to modify, okay. Uh, what does the defects do? The defects change the atoms from their lattice position to some displacement occurs. This displacement can be calculated and modeled using some elastic constraints of the material and how it will take place around dislocations. All these works is required. So, to interpret the results, we should have good idea about the what is happening within the sample, okay, and also about the material behavior, okay, the material properties. Those understanding is also very much necessary to get uh, good correlation between. Uh, uh, high resolution the images okay, and the structure of the models. So, using the present day microscopes what we can do is that we are not uh, modeling a uh, ideal structure, we can get a structure material which contains defects that is a defective structure how it looks like and what sort of contrast that will give rise to or when we get a microstructure that is atomic resolution from a sample. From that we can find out how atoms are displaced from the lattice site. Okay. That is essentially we get information of the defective structure that is possible in a, a present day microscopes. Okay. I will stop here now. Thank you. <laughs>